How does scoliosis affect hormones? Although a spinal condition, the effects of scoliosis can be widespread throughout the body. Yes, scoliosis can affect hormones. Studies have found levels of some hormones to be higher in those with scoliosis. Estrogen tends to be a bone growth signaling hormone and progesterone is its sister hormone to estrogen and it's also associated with reproductive health. And it's suggested that hormone imbalances can be a factor in the development of progression of idiopathic scoliosis. Now, it's not fully clear if the hormone imbalances contribute to the development of idiopathic scoliosis or if the scoliosis causes this hormonal imbalance to develop. But we do know that scoliosis is associated with patients that have irregular periods, and these are females that have scoliosis, can have a later first period than peers that don't have scoliosis. And we also know sometimes these patients can experience he heavy bleeding and potentially more pain during menstruation than patients that don't have scoliosis. So we know there is something to do with scoliosis and hormone development because one of the reasons why we think scoliosis occurs more often in females is because of this early onset of puberty in females versus males. Females tend to go through a school, uh, through their pubescent growth spurt, typically somewhere between 11 and 13, where males tend to go somewhere between 13 and 15. So this earlier stage of onset of hormonal changes that occur during puberty happens at a, sh at a cl earlier time with females, and it also happens faster, that girls go through this pubescent growth spurt over two years, where boys go through more longer uh, pubescent growth spurt, can be up to five years years, six years. So since we know that growth is what triggers the progression and puberty puts adolescents at risk during this rapid phase of progression, it's this rapid unpredictable growth spurts that's also associated with significant hormone changes. There is some connection, even though we don't fully understand them. And the main two conditions that we, when we look at scoliosis patients is we look at adolescent patients, but we also look at adult patients. In adult patients, we have two main types. We have idiopathic idiopathic scoliosis, and these are patients that normally were adolescents that are now dealing with the effects in the adult stage, but there's also something called degenerative scoliosis. And degenerative scoliosis is also named de novo scoliosis. And these are patients that did not have scoliosis as a child, but are now dealing with a scoliosis that has occurred as a result of abnormal age-related spinal degeneration. And this abnormal age-related degeneration is also more common in females than males. And this is something that happened as a result of hormone changes that potentially occur during menopause. And this can affect bone density, muscle density, muscle strength, and they tend to be more affected. So we see this more often in females, and the spine can start to progress relatively rapidly in this menopausal or postmenopausal phase. So other than the hormones that are, that are potentially affected, we know scoliosis can have very significant effects to the body. And since most, the most common effect in childhood is uneven posture, like uneven shoulders, uneven hips, uneven waist, uneven rib cage, and this asymmetrical posture that we tend to see, which can lead to many other issues when the patient is looking at their scoliosis in the adolescent form. In the adult form, the most common effect is scoliosis pain. Now, pain doesn't become compressive, which may lead to this type of scoliosis pain that we're talking about, into the adult form. So most kids don't feel pain when they have scoliosis, but a lot of adults can feel pain because as the curve progresses in the adult form, it is a result of compression. And scoliosis pain can include muscle pain, back pain, nerve pain that radiates into the extremities as a result of this nerve compression. And the best way to minimize the effects of all these things when it comes to scoliosis is really treating the size of scoliosis proactively. The smaller we can keep the curve, the smaller we can deal with the size of the curvature, the normal we, can, we de can deal with the effects. And one important factor to talk about is causation. No matter what the cause of the scoliosis, so let's say it's inverted and say the hormone imbalance is what caused the scoliosis, if you were to balance their hormones once they already have a significant scoliosis, it doesn't mean the spine now is gonna rapidly get straighter by itself. Because now once the scoliosis has started and the person has started to grow and develop with the scoliosis, and by the time we typically diagnose it, the patients you know, typically have 25, 30, 35 degree scoliosis, these curves have become very structural. And because they've become very structural, you must address the curve on a structural level even though something else may have caused it. So if it was the other way around, that the hormones caused the curve to occur, 
you still need to deal with the curve on a structural level. And we know scoliosis is a progressive condition, but as the curve progresses, it becomes much more difficult to treat. So therefore, we recommend treating scoliosis as early when they're initially detected and trying to deal with this structural approach to scoliosis as soon as we see the curvature there. Because as the curve gets bigger, the size of the curve becomes the reason why the curve continues to worsen. It is a vicious cycle, and that's what they call scoliosis, because as the curve gets bigger, what's making it get bigger is the as is the curve getting bigger, not what initially caused it in the majority of cases. So most cases, scoliosis is highly treatable, especially in a proactive approach, if we act early. Many cases of scoliosis will never require surgery, and this require a really conservative treatment that's integrative, but combining really the power of chiropractic care, physical therapy, scoliosis exercises, corrective bracing, and rehabilitation to control the size of the curve, which is what's leading to the effects to the body. Now, scoliosis can affect the body in many different ways, and we don't fully understand the role of hormones in the development or progression of scoliosis, whether the scoliosis is affecting the hormones or the hormones are affecting the scoliosis. But studies have definitely shown that sort of hormone levels are higher in patients with scoliosis, and the progression of scoliosis, especially idiopathic scoliosis, does coincide with hormonal changes in both adolescents and adults. So therefore, we want to deal with the size of curvature, because as we can control the size of curvature, we deal, we're dealing with the mechanism that leads to progression, because as the curve gets bigger, like I said, it's more than likely can it continue to get bigger. So controlling the size controls the effects. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this information helpful. If you have any questions about this topic or other scoliosis questions, type in the comments below and let us know. And finally, subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified of when we publish new videos just like this.